So good morning, everyone. So this is the fifth lecture. Let me just briefly remind you about the first problem sheet, which is due to uh, due at uh, due on November the third, and also there is the second problem sheet already there on the web page. Uh, maybe let's begin by a small introduction of what we have been doing recently. So if you remember last time we talked about the uh, basic principles of general relativity, uh, the uh, equivalence principle, uh, the max principle, and then also a little bit about non-Euclidean geometries, uh, how they work, uh, what they are, and how they can be useful in describing gravity, at least possibly. And during the today's lecture, we will first talk about an important notion, a notion of manifolds. Uh, manifolds are general mathematical objects which you can parameterize with coordinates and they generalize the standard um, space-time and standard uh, space Rn, the product of the real line by itself and times, to more complicated cases and it's an extremely useful notion in differential geometry and one uh, I would like everybody to understand. Uh, after that, we'll talk a little bit more about coordinate transformations, and I will do a blackboard lecture with your participation um, as well. Uh, and after the blackboard blackboard lecture, the second part will be a pseudo Riemannian manifold. So we will talk a little bit about uh, the uh, pseudo Riemannian geometry on uh, manifolds how it works and we will not finish this topic because it's rather broad but we'll at least begin okay so let's begin with the notion of a manifold uh, manifold is an extremely useful thing in differential geometry it generalizes the notion of a surface so if you if you recall or a, or a curve if you recall, in, in standard geometry, surfaces and curves were very important things. Uh, and the main th the, their main feature is that when you look at them closely in, in a small neighborhood, they pretty much can be uniquely parameterized by a set of numbers. One number, it's a curve. Two numbers, it's a surface. And you can generalize it to any dimension. In standard geometry, we think of surfaces and curves as things that live in a bigger Euclidean space. But one of the main things of, of, of the theory of manifolds, one of the main goals is to somehow free ourselves from, uh, from this picture of a manifold being embedded in a bigger space. Rather, we want to think about manifolds as something that live, has a life of its own, independent of, other, uh, of any other objects. Uh, so a manifold is a set that can be parameterized by n numbers called coordinates near any point. Uh, the reason why we want to parameterize uh, this object by n numbers is that in differential geometry, we would like to use the machinery of multivariate calculus. So taking partial derivatives, taking total derivatives, integrating over curves or over surfaces. We want to be able to use all this machinery on a manifold, which is not quite the same thing as R n, so the set of of tuples of numbers, where we know how to do calculus from our calculus one or one course. But if we want to perform calculus on more complicated sets, uh, we would like to be able to parameterize uh, everything with numbers. We also want to be able to use the tensor algebra, so the notions of vectors, tensors, one forms on a manifold. And again, as it will turn out, the notion of coordinate system will turn out to be extremely useful for that. I will try to explain this. Of course, the most important notion is the notion of a coordinate system. Uh, and here we have to think about local coordinate systems. Sometimes it happens that a manifold can be covered by a global coordinate system, but this is not usually the case. And we tend to think of coordinate systems as something that parameterizes only a part of our manifold. Uh, instead of telling, instead of spelling out the full definition, mathematical definition, 
which would require a bit of more introduction to topology and um, other deeper branches of mathematics, I will more try to explain on pictures how the definition of manifold actually works, uh, how exactly it is useful, uh, what features of, of, the man, of, of a manifold are the most important ones. Uh, okay. So I like explaining things on pictures. Here's a picture. What you see here on the left-hand side is supposed to represent a manifold. It's a kind of two-surface, compact two-surface, meaning it's, it's, it's finite, it doesn't extend to infinity. Uh, we call it M, but this is not all we have here. We also have a set of so-called charts. So here, here we have M, which is supposed to be a topological space. Without going into details, this simply means that we have the notion of continuity and the notion of limit of a sequence given on M. So given a sequence, we know what, what its limit is, and we know what a continuous map is on this manifold. Uh, on, top, on top of that, we've got a set of so-called charts. Uh, charts are basically a more abstract way to talk about coordinate systems. So a single chart is basically a, a subset of our manifold, a kind of patch here, I call, I call this one U1, together with a map called phi1, into appropriate space r to the power of n, n is the dimension of our manifold. Um, this uh, map has, a, uh, uh, has an image, which you see as this gray ellipse over here, phi one of u one. But we also have more, more patches and uh, more, uh, more charts, phi two. Uh, the the uh, domains of, of each of these maps, so, the patches from which the, the, the atlas is made can and will in general overlap. You can see the overlap U1 uh, with U2 over here, and it is mapped to this slightly brighter area E1 uh, uh, in the top phi1 mapping and in the lower one. Uh, phi is basically our coordinate system because it assigns to each point uh, a point in Rn, so n numbers. And we make a couple of assumptions. Uh, so we call this thing an atlas of charts. If uh, all these patches from which, which are mapped by, on which we have defined coordinate systems, they all sum to our manifold. So the whole manifold is supposed to be covered with patches of this kind. There should be no point left missing. We also assume that each of these maps is one to one. This is an obvious requirement. We would prefer uh, different points to, to have different coordinates. Mm, we don't want two different points to be assigned the same coordinates. That would be pretty bad. We assume that each of these maps is continuous. So it represents well uh, the notion of, of continuity here, the notion of continuous functions, or the uh, notion of limits of a, of a sequence or, uh, or of a function. Uh, so these are kind of straightforward requirements you can easily understand. With, with this setup, every, every point is covered by at least one uh, coordinate, at least one coordinate system. But now there is something a bit more complicated. So as you notice, there is a common region for, for two coordinate patches here, this U1 times U2. Uh, let's take the image of this uh, of this image under phi2 that's this slightly brighter pink area uh, since phi2 is one to one we can take the inverse of phi2 that will take us from this point let's say to somewhere here and then we can apply the map phi1 which takes us to, back to the uh, gray area uh, slightly brighter gray area in the image of phi1 uh, now, this, uh, this composition, phi 2 to minus 1 times phi 1, that's something that takes us from one part of Rn to another part of Rn. And that's a very good thing because maps from Rn to Rn are exactly what we have studied in calculus uh, and in mathematical analysis uh, during the undergraduate and graduate courses. That's exactly the type of functions we normally call, call functions. So there will be n coordinates over here given as functions of n coordinates over here. Uh, this is, and now we, we make certain assumptions regarding this map. Uh, we demand this map to be smooth. 
uh, this means that it's it's continuously differentiable in the standard way. It's a map between uh, Rn and Rn. So all partial derivatives exist up to whatever order you want, and they're all continuous. Uh, and yeah, it turns out that if we assume that, we also have as a corollary that the determinant of the Jacobian, so the, the, the uh, map of partial derivatives of, let's say, xi over here, uh, with respect to yi over there, this has to be non-vanishing. It has to be finite and non-vanishing. Uh, why do we demand that? The reason is that if a part of the manifold can be uh, uh, lies within the uh, uh, within the uh, range of a, of two charts or more charts, it means that it can be represented in more than one way as a, as as a subset of R n. And now we have to make sure that these representations are in a sense equivalent. They lead to exactly the same notions of differentiability. Uh, and so on. And hence, we take this compatibility condition over here with respect to any pairs of uh, charts which have, a, which have an overlap. Uh, is this clear? OK, I don't hear any questions. Uh, I had one question. Can I ask? Yes, yes, sure, of course. So the thing is that when we are saying u of alpha, this mm -hmm. is not a coordinate system. This is just the description of the manifold right and uh, then it's it, it's a it's a subset of the manifold on which our coordinate system lives lives okay but so it's just describing the manifold partially right yes it, it, yes it's one. a subset of the manifold it's it's a small yeah. patch of the manifold which is covered by this particular coordinate system okay 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 thank you and phi one is a kind of abstract representation of the coordinate system you take the point and you get n numbers ah okay okay thank you and then coming, and that the map I was talking about, this phi two to minus one circle phi one composed with phi one, that's basically a map which gives you a coordinate change. This is will be discussed in the next on the next slide. Okay, uh, now a couple of remarks. We have to live with the fact that for most manifolds, because of topological reasons or other reasons, uh, you cannot usually define a global chart. Sometimes you can. In the simplest possible case, you can, but in most cases, you cannot, and you have to live with the with the fact that your coordinate systems only cover a part of your manifold. Uh, charts are basically local. You've got some kind of subset U1, which is covered by this chart, a U2, which is covered by a different one, uh, and on the overlap, you have you have some kind of coordinate transformation between these two. So many manifolds do not have a single global chart. Or sometimes they do have a global chart, but this chart is for many physical reasons, not the most useful one. We will see it during this course. Um, it may happen that, uh, so in general relativity, we very often adjust our coordinate system uh, to some kind of particular physical problem. And the one which, which somehow simplifies the problem may fail to be global for some reason. Uh, so, if we have an overlap, we have transition maps between the charts. That's just red arrow over here. So we, we take phi 2 to minus 1, the inverse of phi 2, which takes us to the manifold. And then we use phi 1 to go back to Rn. And this defines a transition map from uh, if, we, if we call the coordinates on this Rn, y1 to yn, and here we call, you call them x1 to xn, then you get this type of transition between this set over here and this one over there. That's the coordinate transform. A bit of an abstract view, but uh, it's a bit useful. Um, and the definition of manifold is, in a sense, minimalistic. Uh, it's minimalistic in the sense that we uh, assume that the whole manifold is covered by some kind of uh, coordinate patches. However, you can always enlarge your atlas. The atlas should cover the whole of that, but you can always add new new uh, coordinate systems and new patches to your atlas, uh, enlarge your atlas by picking new coordinate systems, uh, specifying a new domain, and usually you specify the transition maps. We'll do it uh, quite often in, in our course. And in fact, you have been doing this in your undergraduate physics course, but it, it wasn't given in, in, in these terms. In fact, mathematicians often called about the maximal atlas, which is a enormously big atlas 
containing all possible coordinate systems. But we will not do it. Uh, these three dots over here represent all other coordinate systems we, we have over here. There will be many more of them. Okay. Now, I how do we call that system? Uh, sorry? Yeah, I have a question yes? about this. So the charts are this U and the abstract representation of the coordinates are this pi. Right. So at for each excuse chart, me, yeah. excuse me. Strictly speaking, it's the pair which is the, which is a chart. It's both the domain uh -huh. U alpha and phi. Yeah. The question is like we can uh, in this definition we can only assign one phi to each U. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Strictly speaking, no. There is no problem with defining uh, uh, with defining. No, it doesn't work this way. Uh, you can easily define a different phi for the same U. I would give it a different name. Okay, it's a question question of terminology, but in principle, you can imagine taking uh, taking another chart which has effectively exactly the same domain, but uses a different function phi. That's not a problem at all. Okay. Uh, what this is supposed to represent is that uh, phi are functions. Functions needs a domain on which they are defined, and here we explicitly say that this domain is a kind of subset of M. It doesn't have to be the whole M itself. Okay, thanks. Any more questions? Uh, if you are new to differential geometry, this may look very abstract, but you will see that the, the, the calculations are not really that difficult. Okay, so what are these coordinate systems good for? Uh, let's begin with scalars. A scalar is, is basically a function, so an f which gives you a real number for each point on the manifold. Again, the manifold is an abstract surface. We don't know how to calculate, how to add points on the manifold, how to perform any algebraic calculations, but we've got our uh, beautiful gadget, the coordinate systems, which transform parts of this manifold into uh, tuples of, of points. And that's great. It means we will be able to describe everything as effectively functions of N coordinates. So we will represent our function of f by f composed with phi one to minus one, uh, which is basically a function defined on the uh, range of coordinates over here in Rn and gives us R. So we pick a point here, uh, which is, we, we pick a tuple of, of numbers here. This tuple of numbers represents a, a point over here and f assigns a number to these points. This way, we get our function as a function of points, of the coordinates. And of course, the whole point is that you can do it in many ways. If we have a different coordinate system, we, we will have a slightly different f. And since these are two different coordinate systems, the functional form of f of x1 to xn will be different than f of y1 um, over bar yn bar. But that should not surprise you. We are looking at the same function in two different coordinate systems. So it will not look superficially exactly the same. If this is sine of one of the coordinates, this can be an exponent of a different coordinate, for example. Uh, strictly speaking, this is not f, but rather a representation of f, f, uh, com f composed with, with the appropriate chart. But it's common in differential geometry to write this function from uh, a domain in Rn also as f. It's, it stands for the f itself. F, f is again an abstract thing, but we represent it as a function of, uh, of standard continuous variables. We have different representations, which may look a little bit different, uh, but that's okay. Uh, how do we pass from one representation to the other? Well, we have our, our coordinate transformation map, which gives us x, l, the coordinates here in terms of y, l coordinates over there. So we can write that f of yk uh, is the same as f of, x, uh, of f xl over yk. So if we have our function f of x over here, it's very easy to define our its uh, representation uh, over there by composing this with the uh, transformation map. OK. This is something you have been doing a lot in your undergraduate co course of physics. You just may not recognize that. It's just written in a slightly strange notation. 
Okay, any questions to functions and scalars on manifolds? There is probably none. So now what about vectors? Uh, so when we are talking about manifolds and differential geometry, we always assume that vectors are defined at the particular point of our manifold. So uh, we call them so-called tangent vectors. Uh, this means that we do not combine normally vectors from different uh, vectors attached to different points. They, they live in, di in differential geometry, they live in completely different vector spaces. And we do not have a simple way to combine them, to add them, uh, to take a linear combination of them. It seems you can imagine that at each point of this manifold, there is a separate uh, space, there's a separate vector space of the dimension equal to the dimension of manifold called the tangent space. And you can, you can do all vector operations within each of these spaces, but you cannot mix two different spaces, at least without some additional structure. Mm, in particular, we don't think of vectors as something that connects to distant points. Uh, in, in general differential geometry. So the notion, of, the generalization of notion of vectors to manifolds is a bit different than the vectors you see uh, in the standard affine space or Rn. Uh, the dimension of each of the spaces uh, with vectors is equal to n. So each the dimension of each tangent space at each point is equal to n, where n is the dimension of the manifold itself. Uh, how should we uh, I will not give you the precise definition of a vector. You can find it in in any of these uh, in any of the textbooks in, in differential geometry or any of, of these relativity textbooks. I think it's more useful to give you some kind of geometric intuition. So a vector will be something like an infinitesimal variation of a point or its coordinates. So we imagine that we vary a little bit the, the this point P. In a coordinate system, this means that we have a small variation of the coordinates. Uh, and this variation is equal to d epsilon, some kind of infinitesimal parameter times xi. xi is exactly the coordinates which give you the direction in which we vary. And that's basically a vector. So take the set of numbers multiplied by some kind of infinitesimal thing, and you will get a small variation of this point over here. Uh, a slightly better and slightly more mathematically precise intuition would be that tangent vectors are something like velocities. So imagine you've got a curve over here, being a curve being a parameterized curve with a parameter lambda. And simply at this point P, you take the derivative of X, I, the, the, the position of uh, your, uh, of this point uh, in some kind of coordinate system. And that, that's, what, that's how you get the components X, I at, of P of a vector. In fact, you can define vectors exactly as this type of uh, tangent vectors to whatever curves might pass through this point P. So it's a bit like a local velocity at this point P. It defines a direction and it defines uh, uh, how quickly we are moving. Uh, so I have a doubt. Yes. Uh, so uh, this tangent uh, tangent vectors uh, is a tangent spaces. Uh, is it a collection of maps uh, which correspond uh, which maps the each point to an another space uh, or another coordinate system or R? What is uh, that x? What is XL? Is it a function or what is that? I don't. I'm not sure if I understand your question. Yeah, so uh, I, I asked the, the vectors, uh, vectors are, is it a function, is it a mapping uh, from a manifold to an, uh, another uh, space? Uh, oh, that, that's the question. At the moment, yeah. we're talking about vectors at the one particular point. And then we'll move to the notion of vector fields, which is an assignment to a, of a vector to every point. So at the moment, we focus on vectors defined at one particular point. But then we'll talk about vector fields, which are vectors defined at each particular one vector defined at each particular point. Uh, so uh, actually, what what is uh, so you told uh, now vectors are defined at one point. So what is yes. exactly uh, we defined uh, at this point? What is exactly x? Uh, okay. Uh, without going into further details, imagine that you have uh, a coordinate system, and a vector will be n numbers. 
and numbers which define the velocity of, of, of the vicious particle which goes through this point. By velocity, I mean simply the derivative of the coordinate with respect to lambda. So it will be n points at each point, and uh, numbers at each point in a given coordinate uh, system. Uh, so to define this vector space or tangent spaces, so we need a coordinate system. So we, uh, that's, so that's this, okay. If you go to a proper differential geometry, uh, okay, if you ask them, we may, we may, I can give you a slightly different definition. Since you ask, I think it's, 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 it would be a good idea. Uh, just a second, please. Mm. Yes, I will share a different screen. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there is, can you see the blackboard? Can you see? Yes, yes, yes. So there is a different way to look at vectors. So what are vectors? What? are vectors on a manifold. So assume that you have, uh, that you know what functions of on, on the manifolds are. So we have f, a function on, of, on, on our manifold, meaning a scalar. So something that takes us from a subset of this manifold to real numbers. And it's smooth in the sense of, of uh, being differentiable as many times as we want. Uh, and a possible, uh, one possible way to define a vector is that it is a, a, a vector at P is something that takes your function uh, and produces a real number out of this. satisfying the following property. If you have two functions, uh, this is equal to, uh, this satisfies the Leibniz rule of for differentiation. Uh, F of P is the, so if you have two functions F and G and you take their product and you act with your vector X, you get, the value of function f times x acting on g and the value of g x acting on f. So x is a linear function of, 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 of it's a linear function of, on, on the space of function, which satisfies this additional property. And it turns out that this type of xp can always be written as a sum over all coordinates of some kind of numbers, df over dxip in a coordinate system. And this is taken in point P, in a coordinate system. So vectors in that sense are all possible derivatives. You can, directional derivatives, you can take with respect to them. Uh, that's one way to look at them. Another is, another way to look at them is to, uh, uh, is to consider all possible curves through a given point P and identify curves which have the same velocity in the same step dx1 L over d lambda is equal to dx2 i over d lambda at P. It turns out that you can define addition and, and taking, uh, you can define the standard vector operations like adding two vectors or taking, uh, or taking um, combination uh, on this type of classes of curves. It's a bit more complicated, but in the end, in both cases, it turns out that there is an n-dimensional space at each point of this manifold, either made of operators which differentiate functions or made of classes of curves. Uh, and that's the more standard definition of a tangent vector. I prefer a simpler one. A tangent vector in a coordinate system is just n numbers which have certain properties. And we'll talk about these properties in a second. Uh, was it clear 
so uh, so i have another doubt is uh, so the care uh, uh, dx is a uh, x takes a function this function uh, this function is a mapping from a manifold to a real space so uh, how uh, this do f by do x i is the uh, that function characterizes each point sorry so no, otherwise if you, so this if is a curve take, this is something else this is a curve a curve is, is a mapping from the from a set of real numbers, let's say from lambda zero to lambda one, into the manifold. On the manifold, we can we can introduce a coordinate system, and in this way, we can represent a curve as n functions of our parameter lambda, right? Which gives us, let's say, the motion. Uh, you can think of a motion of a particle over our manifold. Lambda being some kind of external parameter or time. It gives us a, a position of the particle at each time. And we consider particles which cross a particular point P. All possible curves you can draw here. Is this clear? Uh, yes, uh, yes, it is clear. Yes, thanks. Yes. yes, and then it turns out that you can identify those which happen to have pretty much the same velocity at, at this point over here. And then you could, on the classes of, of curves in which for which you have the same velocity, you can define uh, addition uh, multiplying by, by real numbers and other vector typical vector operations. It's so a little in, bit complicated, but but it works. So in this definition, this uh, xp equal to sigma i x p i do f by do x. So here it is. Uh, we uh, we collect the velocities. Do yeah, it's, exactly. It's like velocities. Uh, okay, velocities okay. At, at this particular point of these different curves are supposed to be different when they cross P, uh, okay, are supposed so... to be the same when they cross P. And if they are the same, we, we say that they belong to the same class of, of, of curves. Uh, so then, so to, uh, to different tangent spaces, we, uh, we need an F. Uh, the, uh, to, different, mm -hmm. uh, to different tangent spaces, do we need an F all the time? So here we uh, here we define velocities by ve velocity vectors. Uh, so, uh, okay. 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 Here the definition goes differently. We have the set of all possible functions on a manifold, or at least on a subset of the manifold containing our point p. And for each function, x p, the vector, is something that gives us a number. Strictly speaking, it it it, it it's supposed to represent the derivative of of our function. Uh, with respect to lambda, so to say. Uh, so we uh, define xp as some as, as a linear function of, of, of functions uh, of a linear functional of of these functions, which additionally satisfies another property over here, which looks a bit like the uh, property of functions with respect to differentiation. If you differentiate a product f times g, you've got f times the derivative of g plus g times the derivative of f. Now it turns out, but this is a difficult theorem that any kind of functional or any kind of function which takes function and gives you real numbers of this kind has to have this form. It's given by n numbers uh, multiplying, multiplying uh, the derivatives. So xp acting on f will be this thing over here. And this should work for all possible functions. And that defines vectors as well. So vectors are ways in which you can differentiate functions defined near P. It turns out that all possible differentiating operators of this kind form an n-dimensional space, linear space. You can add them, multiply them, and so on. That's a rather abstract definition, but at least, but again, it shows you that in the end, in a coordinate system, vectors are defined by n numbers, which we call uh, which we call components or coordinates, uh, as they are over here. So I prefer a less abstract, more uh, direct definition of vectors in which you fix a coordinate system and then n points defined at, at, at uh, n numbers defined at point P give you a vector. Okay, thanks. Uh, no, it is clear. Thank you so much. Okay. Let me go back to the lecture. Mm, yeah, it's over here. Yeah, we are back here.
Yeah, so the idea is that, sorry, vector will be simply a set of, no, of n numbers in a particular coordinate system, and it's assigned to a particular point always. These numbers either represent a velocity of, of, of a point or, or a tangent vector to a curve at a particular point P, but a simpler geometric intuition is that they represent a small variation of position. If we, uh, if we have a very small parameter, the type epsilon, then xi times the small parameter will give us, give us a small variation of position over here. And the thing is that they form an n-dimensional vector space. So you can add them, take their linear combinations, do all things you do with vectors on a vector space. However, there are these are different vector spaces for each point of the manifold. At the moment, we, we have no simple way to identify vectors from different spaces. Later, we will find a way, but at the moment, we don't have any. Okay. The real important, the really important things in, in, in the way I introduce vectors is, is defined in, is, is will be presented on this slide. So what happens if we change the coordinates with, with a vector? So we have a set of functions, xk of yi, which gives us the coordinate change um, somewhere near the point P. Uh, what, is the, uh, what is the new representation of our new vector i uh, in our new coordinate system? you can guess the right the right um, expression if you realize that the coordinates of a vector are exactly this type of velocity uh, components of velocity at a given point or uh, derivatives of a position of a point with respect to lambda now we can if you have them expressed in terms of y you can use the chain rule to express them in terms of our new coordinate system x so dxi over d lambda is dyi over d lambda times uh, dxi over dyi bar. And here we use the Einstein summation condition. Uh, this is summed over i bar. This is the standard chain rule for differentiation. And if you see it over here, it's pretty clear that under coordinate transform, uh, let's say this xy bar in the coordinate system yi bar, transforms into xi by multiplication by matrix, which is basically the matrix of derivatives of x with respect to y's. It's also known as the Jacobian, and you take this thing at the point P. So you can treat this as, as a yet different definition of vectors at a point. A vector is a set of n numbers assigned to each coordinate system, and which transforms in such a way that if you go from coordinates y k to coordinates x k, you are supposed to multiply the components by the Jacobian matrix. Is this clear? Okay, I hope it's clear. I still think that the intuition of vectors as small uh, variations of position or as local velocities with respect to some kind of curves or tangent vectors to curves. This is still a very useful intuition and we will refer to it. Uh, but a definition of a vector may simply be that this is n numbers which are assigned to point P and which transform under coordinate transforms with this transformation rule. Okay, now covectors. Uh, covectors are also defined at a particular point. Uh, again, we do not combine covectors from different points. Uh, the space, by the way, the space of all covectors is known as the cotangent space. Excuse me, is there a question? Uh, no, prob probably not. The dimension of each cotangent space, which is usually denoted by T star PM, is also N. Uh, covectors, if you remember, are supposed to represent uh, the gradients of functions. And I try to draw a gradient of function here. Mm, so the, the, the shade of red is supposed to represent the value of function. And yeah, it, it shows you that it grows in this direction and decreases in that one. So geometric intuition, again, it's not a definition, it's more of an intuition of, of a gradient of, of uh, one form is that this is as a kind of infinitesimal variation of a function. If we change our position by a small delta x i, the value of the function will change by omega i delta x i. 
where omega i is basically the standard gradient, the matrix of partial derivatives in the coordinate system we were working on at this particular point P. Again, a full definition of a covector requires uh, a coordinate transform law for, for covectors. So again, imagine that we are passing from, from coordinates x, i with a bar to coordinate next to coordinates x, i without a bar. And we're given the function of x, k with respect to x, y bar. Uh, we know that omega i bar at the point p is e equal to this thing here. Let this be a gradient of a function f. Again, we can calculate the derivative of this function f uh, with respect to each of the x. Uh, so so this, these components of gradient are the derivatives with respect to the uh, coordinates y, i bar, but we can easily pass to x, i, again, by using the chain rule. So we take df over the y, i bar, times dy i bar over dx i at the point P. And this again, such as the following transformation rule, uh, if we have our covector uh, as omega i bar lower index, we pass th this transforms into omega i equal to omega i bar. And here we are using the inverse of this Jacobian. So the derivatives of y's with respect to x, and it's, it is well known that the Jacobian, this matrix of derivatives times this matrix of derivatives at a given point should give you delta or the unit matrix. So this is the inverse of the Jacobian we talked about before. Yeah, so it, covector transforms with the inverse matrix, so to say, of derivatives. Any questions? I had one question. Can I ask? Yes, of course. Yeah. So the thing is that these things are only true with respect to the regions where the uh, like where phi one and phi two are defined as an intersection, right? Yes, because... but if there is a, yes, but if there is a, only one coordinate system it, in, in one particular point, mm -hmm. then we don't need to, to 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 in principle do any coordinate transforms. Yeah, because then the Jacobian will be zero, right? In uh, no, then there will be no Jacobian. Okay. Jacobian exists only if we have two coordinate systems. But look, uh, I have just presented here two of these uh, mm -hmm. of of these charts. Typically, uh, typically you have infinitely many. All of them. Uh, so even if you have a minimal atlas, which just barely covers your manifold. You can add more and more and more charts by, uh, I don't know, chopping your 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 charts over here, uh, slightly altering the functions. So usually think that around each point you have infinitely many all possible coordinates, and the reason why you have only the reason why 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 I have presented things this way is just for clarity. In fact, okay. typically you have infinitely many coordinate systems everywhere here. So these transformation rules are very useful in the sense that around each point you have whatever coordinates you can invent. The bottom okay. line is that this thing here tells you exactly how you're supposed to change the coordinates of your vector covector at point P. Okay, thank you. Okay, so after covectors, we go to tensors, obviously. And here I will not per perform any derivation. So we've got our manifold M, we've got a point P, we, we have a tensor which I represent with these arrows. And this is a very convenient representation of tensor with two lower indices, but I will, I will later tell you why. Uh, now the, the coordinate transform for, for a tensor of this kind is in fact rather simple. All you need to do is simply to multiply. So, so we then start with in a coordinate system x y i bar, uh, and we go to, to coordinate system x i without a bar. And our new representation t uh, i j t k l blah 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 at the point p will be the, the 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 previous one i bar j bar and so on. And here you multiply each index by either Jacobian or the inverse Jacobian depending on whether the, the index is an upper or lower one. So uh, 
use the Jacobian dx over the yi for each upper index and use the inverse one for each, each lower index. So the formula may look complicated, but it's really easy to figure out. Just take every index. If it's an upper one, then you multiply it by dx i over dyi or whatever letter you use here. And for each lower letter, you, you use this one. And anything that transforms in this way will be called a tensor. Any more questions? Okay. Obviously, th this transformation rule is consistent with the previous one in the sense that uh, a tensor with just one upper index, which is a vector, transforms like a vector. A tensor with just one lower index, which is a covector, transforms like a covector. And the scalar does not have any indices, so it transform. It doesn't transform at all. The value remains the same at the given point p. However, if you want to express everything as a function of coordinates, there will be a change simply because you what is because you describe the argument using different coordinates. Okay, a couple of remarks. So usually we don't work with vectors at a point, but rather with fields. We have a tensor, which is we have you have tensors assigned to each point of the manifold, or at least each point of origin of a manifold. And in that case, what you get from this is described not by a single set of numbers, but rather by a set of functions depending on your coordinate x m. When you perform a coordinate change, you first of all have to deal with the indices, multiply them by appropriate Jacobian or inverse Jacobian. But on top of that, uh, it's also good to express everything as, as, as a function of your new coordinates, which means that the argument will also have to be changed here as well. Uh, one possible way to look at these transformation laws is that we decompose each vector and covector in the coordinate basis related to a given coordinate system. This is a, usually not a not a uh, orthonormal basis. So when you have a coordinate system, every vector xp can be written as uh, components xpi times ei, uh, where this ei is a particular vector uh, defined by our coordinate system. It's basically the one zero 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 at our coordinate system. And these basis vectors are we will denoted by, by EI, uh, but sometimes people denote by them also by del I or, or even D over DX I at the point P. Uh, the reason is again that we can think of vectors as something that differentiates functions and in that case, uh, it acts on functions by differentiating them at p and multiplying by these xi's. So each uh, each coordinate system defines a, a basis of each tangent space at every point, and the same goes for each uh, cotangent space. Uh, the components of we have defined are components when you decompose uh, the vector or covector at every point using the basis AI also written as DXI. This is the 0, 1, 0, 0, and or 0, 0, 0, 1, 0 basis in our coordinate system. Mm, this is not necessary. In fact, instead of using these AIEIs or D over DXIs, you can use a different basis at each point. Uh, this is called uh, this is called using a non-coordinate basis and we will also do it during this course. It's sometimes useful to do it, uh, but at least in the initial part of the of the lecture, we'll avoid that because it's a bit of a complication. Uh, coordinate transformations are very important in GR. You will see it, they're important in physics in general, but in GR they they're even more important and they're also somewhat more difficult. There is more physics related to them, as you will see. So we will practice that uh, during the lecture today and also also later. Uh, okay, I want to show the last picture, which I hope will clarify what what we were talking about. So imagine you've got a manifold plus a tensor field. Uh, a tensor field and a manifold are very abstract things. We don't know how to work with them, so we int we introduce a special gadget called coordinate systems. Uh, in fact, infinitely many of them. I have just picked two which have a small overlap. 
they allow us to represent points by numbers, but they also allow us to, they also define coordinate bases, and this way allow us to uh, decompose tensors or represent tensors as tuples of numbers with upper and lower indices. Uh, since we're dealing with fields, uh, this actually gives us a function in terms of, of our coordinates xi. We can do the same thing with respect to another coordinate system, and this way we get a different representation with this is with bars and with a different coordinate here. But the whole thing is that now we've got our transformation rules, which takes us from one representation to another, at least uh, within the overlap of two charts. So on this overlap, we've got xk, our new coordinate, as a function of the old coordinate. And then the way we pass from the old, old representation to a new one is exactly multiplication by the appropriate derivatives. Plus, it's if we're dealing with, with fields, it's good to change the yk coordinate to xk coordinates over here. And instead of an abstract tensor on an abstract manifold, we've got numbers defined on subsets of Rn, so something we can work with. Okay, that's that's all I, I had to say about manifolds and differential geometry. Uh, uh, I had a question. Can yes, go on. So yes. the thing is that, um, so I come back to my previous question. Mm -hmm. uh, like in this image itself, uh, U2 is exa not exactly covering the point T in the manifold, like the tensor that we are defining in the manifold. Uh, yes, okay. Uh, I assume that this is a whole field. T is rep supposed to represent ah, the whole okay. field. So it's okay, also okay. defined over here. Okay, it's, okay. It's not just a tensor, it's a tensor field. It, it, it exists okay. everywhere or okay. at least mm -hmm. over a big region of, of the manifold. If P was defined over here, then indeed we could not, uh, we wouldn't be able to use U2 to describe it uh, or, or okay. the second chart. Probably there will be, of course, infinitely many other charts which we, yes. which we could use for, for that, but mm -hmm. yeah. It uh, might be okay. a bit confusing if I if I draw it this way, but this is supposed to represent a whole field on the field. Field. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, if there are no questions, then now we will uh, we'll go back to the blackboard. Mm. Let me share this sketchbook. Uh, yeah, so let's go to the blackboard. That's layer number two. Okay, I wanted to practice a little bit coordinate transformations just to make the lecture a bit less abstract. Mm. And we will begin with a manifold you know very well, namely the flat space. Let me open my notes. Yes. Yes, so. Um, Changing coordinates in a flat space. And by flat space, I mean either R n, so the standard uh, space of tuples of function, or the Minkowski space we were talking about. The space of special relativity, the one in which we have the metric would be one minus and number of pluses. Later, I will tell you exactly in what sense they're flat, but they're in a sense simple. And moreover, they're, they're, they're obviously covered, they can be covered with a single coordinate chart. This is obvious in case of Rn, because, well, uh, uh, you can just take the, the identity map, which, which gives you the, 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 the component and height component as your as height coordinate, and that, that will be it. In case of Minkowski space, we've got coordinate system constructed from inertial frames, which are also global and give us, uh, give us four, it's a four dimensional manifold. Let's write it, looks like a four here. And we also defined inertial frames, which give us coordinate systems. Okay, so let's begin with the space R squared, which is a two dimensional Euclidean space basically. 
uh, parameterized by x, y, which we can also call x1, x2. And we want to change the coordinates into so-called polar coordinates. We'll call the standard coordinates Euclidean coordinates. And what we want to do is to define so-called polar coordinates. Which are defined by x equal to r cosine phi, y equal to r sine phi, where r is positive and phi is defined from 0 to 2 pi. So this way we have we have expressed the old coordinates uh, in, as a function of new new ones, but there's also the inverse map, which is pretty obvious. X square y squared equal to that, and phi will be equal to arc cosine x over square root of x squared plus y squared. Yeah. Now the first obvious question is the Jacobian. If you call if you call these new coordinates uh, r phi as our one i one bar y two bar, we ask about the Jacobian. Uh, unlike the lecture here, y is the new coordinate and x is the old one. Uh, I will use capital Latin indices which run from one to two. Mm. Okay, it's already 58, so maybe we'll do the calculations themselves uh, after the break. Uh, yeah, so yeah, let's have a 10 minute break right now. Okay, hello everyone. It's already 10 past, uh, it's already nine past 10. So uh, we can begin our second part of lecture. I will share the blackboard. Here it is. So if you remember, we were talking about the coordinate changes in a flat space. We're changing in the space R squared. So in a standard Euclidean plane, uh, we can transform our coordinates from the standard Euclidean coordinates, global, chart on uh, uh, on R squared to so-called polar coordinates consisting of R and phi. Here is the, uh, this is the transformation one way from R and phi to X, Y, and this is the transformation in the other direction. Uh, now the question is, what is the Jacobian here? So let's try to calculate the Jacobian. In order to calculate the Jacobian, we need all possible derivatives uh, of R and phi, our new coordinates with respect to X and Y. So let's calculate them. The R over the X, that's fairly easy. That's two X over two square root X square plus Y square, which is X over the square root of X square plus Y square. And the derivative with respect to the other component, well, by analogy, this is simply y over square root of x squared plus r squared. We can also write as y over r, and this would be x over r. And then the second thing is the derivative of the arc cos function. Uh, let's move here. So phi was defined by R as arc cos. Mm, X over 
x squared plus y squared. And we need d phi over dx and d phi over dy. Yeah, so the derivative of arc cos is minus one over the square root of one minus whatever we have as the argument, which is x squared uh, squared. So this is x squared plus x squared plus y squared. And this is multiplied by the derivative of what we have here. That's one over the square root of x squared plus y squared. And then minus one half x times the derivative of what we have here, which is this thing to the power of three two times here we got two x as the derivative of what we had in the bracket. So that is, let's first deal with this thing over here. This would be x squared plus y squared minus x squared divided by x squared plus y squared. So in the numerator, we have the square root of x squared plus y squared. And here we've got the square root of, uh, okay. This is a little subtle. This this whole thing works for positive y. For negative y, we have the inversion is a little bit more subtle, but let's let's stick to that. And this is divided by y. Because we take the square root of y squared, which is y. What about the phi over the x? Well, d phi over d x, d phi over d y. This is again minus one divided by the square root of one minus x squared um, x squared over the square root of x squared plus y squared. Ah, uh, sorry, there is no. Uh, yeah, I have to do with that. And here you just have x squared plus y squared. And we complete the square root. And now differentiate with respect to y. Uh, we have minus one half. x remains in the denominator. In the denominator, we'll have x squared plus y squared. Uh, to the power of three half. And here we've got two y. Mm -hmm. which is minus square root of x squared plus y squared over y multiplying minus x y over the square root of x squared plus y squared. This gives, I uh, know this is power three two. Uh, And if you simplify that, what you get on the top will be x. And on the bottom, you see x squared plus y squared.
Oh, we haven't finished that one. Uh, here, we got y squared over we have, and this is minus y over x squared plus y squared. Okay, there is a lot of differentiation involved, but the bottom line is that the final result is dy over dxp. Well, this is going to be just to remind you, the r over the x, the r over the y, the r the phi over the x, the phi over the y. This matrix is x divided by root of x squared plus y squared, y divided by the square root of x squared plus y squared, minus y divided by the x squared plus y squared, x divided by x squared plus y squared. Uh, it's useful to also express all of that in terms of uh, r and phi. And in that case, what you get is cosine phi, sine phi. Recall that x is r cosine phi and y is r sine phi, and this is basically r. And here you get minus sine phi over r, cosine phi over r. Yes. Okay, what about the inverse Jacobian? Well, now we have to differentiate x a with respect to the new coordinates b. Uh, and that's a little simpler in fact. So rem just to remind you, x is r cosine phi. So this transformation is somewhat simpler in this direction. So this will be dx over dr, dx over d phi, dy over dr, dy over d phi. So here we get cosine phi minus r sine phi. This is sine phi and this is r cosine phi. Again, this is in, in a natural way, a function of the bar y bar coordinates, which is r and phi, but there is no problem with expressing it also in terms of x and y. And in fact, it makes a lot of sense. So what we get is x over the square root of x squared plus y squared. So cosine phi is x over r. This will be y over r. This will be y. And here we got minus r sine phi, which is minus y. And here we got just x. Good. Uh, you can check yourselves that these guys are in fact inverse of each other. So d x a over d y b times d y b d x c. This is delta a c. If you multiply this matrix by that one, you get one. Okay. Uh, now, where is this a good transformation? In which point is it a good transformation in the sense of, of uh, a good coordinate transform? Well, we have to check where the determinant of this Jacobian is non-zero and well-defined. 
So let's look at this guy over here. The determinant of that is R cosine squared phi plus R sine squared phi, which is R. Which means that everything is okay if R is positive. On the other hand, if R is equal to zero, so at the very origin, this determinant vanishes and this determinant is infinite, which means that the coordinate transform from the Euclidean to the polar coordinates pretty much works everywhere, but except the origin, the zero point. You cannot cure that. This coordinate system, strictly speaking, doesn't work at the origin. It's pathological there. Mm. Any questions? Okay, if not, then let's go to the next problem. So transformation of the metric tensor. Transforming the metric tensor. So the space R squared has a, a natural scalar product, two vectors X times Y are basically X, X times Y, X plus X, Y times Y, Y or X1, Y1 plus X2, Y2. This is the standard scalar product on a plane. Obviously, it comes from a metric tensor G, A, B, which is simply the unit matrix 0, 0, 0, 1. It's check, easy to check that X times Y is just G, A, B, X, A, Y, B, and that's it. Now, what's the expression for G in the polar coordinates? So how do we do it? We can use explicitly the transformation law for tensors we have used before. Uh, I have introduced on during the lecture today. So GAB is the old GAB in the Cartesian coordinates. This is the polar. This is Cartesian. In the Cartesian coordinates metric has always this type of simplified form. And then what we need is uh, delta x a delta y a bar, delta x b delta y b bar. Since these indices are lower, we need something with an upper index, unbarred upper index here. This is XA. On the other hand, an upper index in the denominator is basically the lower index. That's how you can remember this transformation formula. Okay. And the simplest way to work with that is to write this in a matrix form. So this is equivalent to taking G. Then the second, the second uh, index of G multiplies the first index of this guy over here. So here we've got G X over D Y. And here the first index of G multiplies the first index of this guy here. So there is a transposition involved here. D X over D Y transpose. So that's the matrix form. This is strictly speaking the inverse Jacobian transpose times G times Jacobian. Is it clear why we have a transpose here? This may be a bit of unclear to you. The reason is that in the way we have expressed these Jacobians as uh, matrices. This is a matrix G A B bar. This upper index 
uh, that's the j to minus one. And this is j a bar b. So in this inverse Jacobian, uh, the index x a is the upper one, and the index b bar is, is, is the second one, is lower and it's the second one. Now, when we go over here, this is the inverse. Uh, yeah. This is the inverse Jacobian B, B bar. This is the inverse Jacobian A, A bar. So in order to change this into a product of matrices, uh, we need the second index of each matrix to be multiplied with the first of the next one. But here it's the other, other way around. The first index of this is multiplied by the first index of, of that one. But we can change this by uh, transposing this matrix over here. And now everything works fine. So if we do it, what we get is cosine phi, sine phi, minus r sine phi, cosine phi. Then we've got a unit matrix which multiplies this one and gives us just the, the standard matrix. Minus r sine phi, sine phi, r cosine phi. And the result is cosine squared plus sine squared. This is one. Minus r sine cosine plus r sine cosine, which is zero. Here we've got minus r sine cosine. Uh, so there's an r over here, right? Plus r sine cosine, so this is zero. And here we've got r squared sine squared. plus r squared cosine squared phi. So this is one zero zero r squared. Okay, so the resulting matrix is diagonal, but it's not as trivial as it used to be. It's one zero zero r squared. That's the metric tensor in new coordinates. Any questions to this? I have a question for the uh, transpose metric actually. Here? So, yes. So the thing is that I understand why we are doing the transpose over here, but mm -hmm. uh, when we have like a given equation, which is not this one, like any other given equation with respect to GR, and how will we know that where we have to take this transpose? Because then we need to know that Okay, so this indice is matching this one, and then and only then there has to be a transpose, right? Let's do it in slow motion then. So we know that the new matrix G A B B bar is given by G A B, and here we've got this inverse Jacobian A A bar, inverse Jacobian B. B bar. Now, how does matrix multiplication work? It works that A, A, B is equal to A, uh, let me use a different letter, well, A, I, A is equal to some kind of C, I, J times D, J, K. And the summing is over this internal index, right? That's how mat matrix mu multiplication works. Now, this is almost like a product of three matrices. So if we plug this thing here, what we get is j to minus one a, a bar, g a b, j to minus one b, b bar. And that's very nice. That's basically g times j minus one as matrices. 
but here we, we run into a problem. The first index of here is supposed to be, uh, sorry. So the first index here is supposed to be contracted with the first index here. And that's not matrix multiplication, but this is the multiplication by the transpose matrix. So we can also write it as, no, I was, I wanted a different one. I wanted that one. I wanted that one. So there is still the option of just writing step by step what is G zero zero. That's uh, G I understand G this part. Yeah, I understand this part. But but I but there is a clever trick of of expressing this as a matrix product. Now mm -hmm. this doesn't work, but if you if you write it in this way. You take the transpose, it has these um, components, and then you've got GAB, and then you've got J to minus one B, B bar. Then you are multiplying the second index of this guy with the first one of, the, of, of that one, and you're multiplying the second index of this guy with the first one of this one, and that's precisely multiplication of three matrices by, by each other. This one, by that one, by that one. So it's a bit of a computational trick, which is which you have to know. That's J to minus one transpose times G times J to minus one. It's a useful trick for indices for for tensors which have two indices, you can very often write these transformation laws as this type of multiplications. On the other hand, if we had a, a, a tensor of balance AB uh, with one index being upper, the other being lower, then the new tensor is basically the Jacobian A bar A times TA B bar Jacobian minus one B, B bar, which is just a J T J to minus one. So for tensors with one index up and one index down, there is no need for any kind of transposition tricks. But if the indices are both down or if the indices are both up, the transformation law that's a bit harder. You have to write the transformation law appropriately. So here you have G, J, A bar, A, J, B bar, B. And then you can write it as J, A bar, A, T, A, B. And here you have to transpose this guy. And now this is the product of this matrix, meaning the second index multiplies the first index here. The second index multiplies the first index here. So you can write this as J, T, J transpose. So the issue arises whenever you want to uh, recast this type of tensorial transformation laws as matrix multiplication. You have to be a bit of careful with that. You want your multiplication to you want to recast your transformation law in, in the following way. You've got one two by two object. Uh, the second index is supposed to be contracted with the first object of another index. And then the second object here with an, uh, sorry, this is supposed to be, yeah, this is supposed to be B. Yeah. And then the second index of this object needs to be translated saturate with, with, with the first index of that object. For mixed, this type of mixed tensor, this is automatic. For this tensor or this tensor, it's not automatic. You have to do a clever transposition of one of the Jacobians, and then you get your transformation law as a matrix product. But this is a computational trick. You can always revert back to the formula and just consider it component by component, and then it should also work. Uh, 
was this clear? Uh, yes, it was clear. So actually, my question was more on a general side, but I got one more question from this explanation. I'll ask that one first. So the thing is that when uh, you, so over here, you did the transposition mm -hmm. for the matrix, which is uh, like not the one where, which you did over here, right? Like in G, A, B, A bar, B bar. The transposition was done for the inverse matrix mm -hmm. before. But in this case of T A B or T A bar B bar, we are doing it uh, after. The, yes. So is this because of the position of the indices? Yes. The thing is that yes, exactly. You have to figure it out for yourself. You've got mm -hmm. this this formula over here, and you want to write mm -hmm. it as a product of matrices. So yes. something two dimensional times another two dimensional things times mm -hmm. another two dimensional thing, but you want this always the second index of what is on the left to be contracted with the first index of the next one. Mm -hmm. Only in this way, you can represent everything as a matrix multiplication. Mm -hmm. And for this trick to work, you have no other choice but to transpose the second matrix here okay. and to transpose the first matrix here. Mm -hmm. Go and check yourself that that's the way it works. Yeah, By yeah, the yeah. way, in a second, I will show you a yet different way to, transpo to, to transform the matrix, which is in many cases even simpler than this one. But this is useful okay. as well. Mm -hmm. So for two by two, uh, so for indices of valence 2, 0, 1, 1, or 0, 2, it's very often useful to write the, trans the, the tra coordinate transform as a matrix multiplication. And it sometimes gives the simplest answer. But in many cases, there's a yet simpler way to, to perform the transformation. And it's so important that I wanted to show you. Mm -hmm. And even simpler method for the metric. It's also important in the sense that the notation I will introduce in a second is very common in, in relativity and differential geometry. So we have written that the metric in Cartesian coordinates is one, zero, zero, one. But this is very often written in a very different way which at first looks quite strange. So we write something called the line element, which is nothing else but the matrix GAB times small variations of our coordinates, dx, a, dx, b. This is supposed to represent differentials of or infinitesimal variations of x. And this is basically dx zero squared plus dx one squared. And since we called x zero x and x1, y, this is the x squared plus the y squared. And the way to think about it is that the square of, very small square of distance is supposed to be the x squared plus the y squared. Something like, this looks very much like the Pythagoras theorem. Uh, but this is in fact just rewriting the definition of the metric or the definition of the length of, of, of a vector or the definition of a small uh, increment of distance uh, using GAB. This is sometimes called the line element. And now we would like to see what this line element looks like in our new coordinates. Uh, which is then G zero zero, sorry, G one one. This is supposed to be A and B, which is G Y one squared plus, we've got two terms of the type G one two, G Y one, G Y two. So here we consider dy1, dy2 as the same thing as dy2, dy1. And we also remember that gab is gba. So it's enough to represent our this expression using g12. g21 is exactly the same thing. And then we get g22, dy2 squared. So we want to find this representation. 
And how do we go about that? It's actually very easy. Look at the transformation law from the old, from the new coordinates to the new ones. We can differentiate that. So a total variation of x is just a variation of r cosine phi minus r sine phi d phi. This is the chain rule. A variation of x can be expressed by a variation of r by differentiating with respect to r, or a variation with respect to phi by differentiating with respect to phi. The same goes for dy. Mm, sorry, this is supposed to be sine. Again, I'm not paying enough attention. Plus r cosine phi d phi. Okay. Is is it clear where these relations come from? They come from differentiating of this thing here and taking the, the total derivative of x with respect to all coordinates. You've got the r increments of r and phi. And then you just plug it here. So ds squared is equal to b is equal to dx squared. So let's do it in slow motion. Uh, plus the same for the R. It looks like a strange notation, but you can you can give a particular meaning to these defies. Uh, they're basically the basis of the covector space uh, arising from the coordinates x and y and r phi uh, uh, and d phi is basically the gradient or a small differential of phi the r is a small differential of r as a function on the manifold okay now let's try to do the algebraic operations here we are left with the r squared cosine squared phi minus 2r cosine phi sine phi dr d phi plus r squared sine squared phi d phi squared plus the same from the other one plus a mixed term dr d phi plus r squared cosine squared phi d phi squared. Okay, now it looks very nice. It's easy to see what happens when you, you add together these two expressions. So this will produce a dr squared because of the cosine squared sine squared. Uh, these two terms will cancel out because it's the same term with a different sign. And this will give us r squared d phi squared. And that's the metric in our new coordinates in the sense of the line element. And this is much faster than any other method I know. In fact, by far the fastest method you see. So you write your ds squared, which is just G, the metric GAD uh, multiplied by these strange things. Strictly speaking, this is something called the symmetrized tensorial product, but you don't need to have, you don't need to know it. You can still think that this is an expression for a very small increment of distance squared in terms of small increments of coordinates. And from this increments, we pass to the increments of coordinates r and phi just by performing this type of, uh, uh, this type of, uh, by using this type of total differential um, expression. Is this method clear or is it very strange and alien? Um, this is clear, but uh, I just wanted to ask one thing with respect to the previous method. Okay, so, let's go back to the previous one. Uh, so, so the thing is that uh, in this method as well, when we are looking at, so over here, because the transformations are based on the Jacobian, that's yes. why uh, it's easy to have these things transposed and we know which, like any one of them can be transposed and yes. we, we will get the values right but uh, what if we are not dealing with uh, the objects which are not tensors because these kinds of things will also exist in here right 
Uh, so, you mean you mean objects which have more indices, for example? No, so they might not be following exactly the transformation as tensors, but they might have oh. other terms. So, oh. so okay, we'll not deal with them very much in this course at all. Oh, okay. So the, 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 there is a couple of other objects. So there are objects called densities, which transform, mm -hmm. which also follow a similar transform law, except that. Mm -hmm. Except that they're also multiplied by an appropriate power of the determinant of right? Oh, okay. Uh, they're called densities or densitized tensors. Mm -hmm. We'll not deal with them in this course, but they exist. And on top of that, we will talk with uh, a special object called connection or connection coefficients, which have a yet different transformation rule. Uh, the answer is that in that case, you probably have to go term, you have to go uh, component by component. So okay. there's always the, the pedestrian way. Mm -hmm. Let's do it. It's, I think it's this type of transformations are very important. So it's better to, to spend a bit more time on them, even if it looks a little boring. Uh, so we could have always tried to solve this problem in the following way. G zero G one one. That's basically G A B D X A over D Y one D X B over D one one, which is G one one D X one over D Y one bar dx1 over dy1 bar plus g1 2 and this is twice d okay let's do it in, in, in an even more pedestrian way then we have g1 2 dx1 over d1 bar dx2 over dy1 bar plus g21 dx2 over dy1 bar dx1 over dy1 bar plus g22 dx2 over dy1 bar dx2 over dy1 bar. So here we have explicitly uh, we have we have amadoned the Einstein's convention and wrote the summation explicitly. And you can see that it's four terms and it's already quite ugly. Uh, we've got expressions for each of these derivatives. Moreover, we know that these mixed terms are always equal. And in fact, they're equal to zero in our case because G12 and G21 are equal to zero. So we are in fact left with dx1 over dy1 bar squared plus dx2 over d y1 bar squared. Uh, now we have to go back. Here. Uh, this is cosine square. And this is sine. So this is cosine and this is sine. So dx1 over one bar over y1 is cosine and dx2 over y1 is sine. So this is sine and cosine basically. And when we go here, we realize that this is then cosine square phi plus sine square phi, which is equal to one. And you can perform the same for two more components. And it should give you zero. And G to two should give you R squared. The problem is that when you go to higher dimensional, higher dimensions, this becomes a little bit ugly. And any kind of simplification of calculations, which makes it much, uh, or any kind of reframing of these calculations, which makes you, which makes it less error prone, would be good. 
and writing these transformation laws as matrix products is a way to simplify your life basically instead of performing all the summation you just write j to minus one g j to minus one with a transposition i think on the left matrix multiplication is something you should by now know very well so this should work a little better also because you can do it in two steps you do your first multiplication and then your second multiplication instead of uh, working with a huge expression if you work in, in dimension four there's in principle 16 terms of this kind which is kind of agreed to work with so this is a little better however i still think that in real life life calculations the method with differentials this one usually leads to the result uh in the fastest possible way was this clear yeah this was clear because this method when we are working with high dimensions and uh maybe if we are having some uh, terms in gab which is not unity at yes. that time it might get a bit ugly right this one yeah yes it might although in practice if it does then all other methods are ugly as well mm -hmm. and i don't know then you're either very patient and do your calculations with somebody okay. else or you use appropriate computer assisted algebra uh which is which is supposed to confirm your your calculations okay thank you okay um, let's do one more thing transforming a function this is trivial but but, but it's important so we have a function f of x y equal to x squared plus y squared it depends on two on both uh, coordinates in this way uh, we switch to r phi what will what is going to look like well f of r phi is going to be r cosine phi of course i have chosen a function which will have a nice representation on the other in the other coordinate system that's just r squared and you see that the representation is very different this one depends on both coordinates x and y or x x1 y1 this this one here only on the first one so transforming a function the value of a function at a point does not transform but since we transform the arguments the functional form changes as well okay a transforming coordinate system is so important that we will do another example. This is called Rindler's accelerating frame. Let me just write what it looks like. Rindler's, or Rindler's accelerating coordinates. And this time it's in the four dimensional Minkowski space. So we have x0 to x3, this corresponding to time this correspond to x y z uh, and we define a new coordinate system sigma x y a assuming that a is positive and sigma is just a real number and the definition is the following we don't touch the x and y coordinates it's in practice, we only change the 0 and 3 or the t and z, and we change them in the following way. The t is related to the old co to, to the new coordinates by a hyperbolic sine sigma, z is equal to a hyperbolic cosine sigma. Okay, this is an important coordinate system, and uh, we will probably talk about it during the next lecture. At the moment, let's just do the transformation of the metric. The metric is minus dt squared plus dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared, or according to our new notation. Let's calculate the differentials. This is the simplest method again. Uh, a 
hyperbolic cosine sigma d sigma. It looks like a hyperbolic counterpart of polar coordinates, and that's in a sense true. There is a big analogy with the previous example when you think of that. And now let's calculate minus dt squared plus dz squared. What is that? That's the a squared sine h squared sigma plus two sine h sigma cos sigma a d a d sigma. Uh, sorry, this has to go with a minus. Minus a squared cos squared sigma d sigma squared plus. Uh, here we have the a squared with a plus with the cos squared sigma plus two and a mixed term. And we already see there will be a simplification of the mixed term. Very nice. And then we've got a squared hyperbolic sine squared sigma d sigma squared. Okay, we need to add these two things together. So we get cosine squared sigma minus sine, uh, cos sigma mi squared minus hyperbolic sine sigma squared. This will give us one. Here we have the same thing, but with a different sign. So this will give us minus one and there will be no mixed terms. So let's go to the next slide. Minus dt squared plus dz squared is equal to uh, d a squared minus a squared d sigma squared. So the whole line element is let's start with the time, time uh, type of coordinate, which is sigma plus the x squared plus the y squared plus the a squared. And that's the new metric tensor. G mu mu is then minus a squared one, 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 and zeros everywhere else. Okay, we'll talk more about these coordinates and how they work in the next lecture. I think they're very interesting. So yeah, uh, I will stop sharing screens. Do you have any questions? Okay, I don't hear any questions. So in this case, uh, let's meet in a week. Uh, again, I remind you about the deadline for the first problem sheet coming in a, in a few days. And well, see you next week.